Aloha, welcome to the Elon Marley Podcast. It's your boy, Crypto Roots, and everything current. Hey, what's up, brother? What up, man? How's it going? You know, thank you guys for joining in and listening and, you know, showing the love. And, you know, if you need a, uh, a dual consultation for your cryptocurrency investments or strategies, you can hit both of us up. We've both got different sides of the game. We've been in the game for over three years. And uh, we've been grinding on YouTube. So all of our, our track records is all there, you know? And uh, everything currency is on top of it. Everything, he's on top of it. So um, start off. What are your most three bullish coins right now? Three top bullish coins. Just give me some quick reasons why you're so bullish. And yeah, let me, fill me in. Let me know, you know? Three, three bullish coins right now? Three bullish. Bitcoin. Yep, okay. Um, link and DOS. All right, all right. So I, I, I already assume why you say Bitcoin. I assume. Would you like to go over why you choose Bitcoin, just to make it clarify for all the new people? Um, because you know, just for, just so you know, it's like you can love any altcoin you want, but Bitcoin is father. Bitcoin is king. You know, if Bitcoin decides that he's going to zero, he gonna bring ninety eight percent of the market with him. Okay, so this point in time, remind me to talk about that. Now, wh why, why link and why uh, DOS? Um, DOS because I got in that thing super early, and you said bullish, and that thing has been pumping for me like crazy, like like stupid pumping. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so that that one is just bullish because it's just bullish, and then link because. Um, you know, the whole market sentiment around Link is just so huge, you know, and, uh, you know, rightfully so, you know, like Link is doing, doing good things, you know, and um, so, yeah, that's why I chose those. That's why those three just pop into my head. It's not like those are my biggest holds or nothing. They just kind of popped in my head first. All right. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up that. First of all, band protocol is coming for Link's ass right now. I'm telling you. If not, oh, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, so is DOS. Uh, they, they all in the same game? They, uh, they're all part of Yeah, that. they all in the same game. Band, DOS, TRB. They well, all coming for. You know what? Only time, obviously, only time will tell. But uh, as, as you know, in the Pepsi game, as you know, in gas stations, they, there's always room for a competitor, if not three or four other competitors. Same thing with cars. Yeah. There's always enough room, right? You know, you go to a gas station, there's four different state gas stations on each corner all on the same corner there's each corner's got a yeah you no know? so so people ask me like why would you get in dos why did you get in dos and i tell people one of the main reasons is because i missed the link train and i said you know link has to have a competitor <laughs> you know every every uh every good business has a competitor somebody who is going you know be a rival to what they're doing so you brought up bitcoin and he's saying Bitcoin's father, Bitcoin's it. And, you know, um, and here's the thing. Right now, the big Bitcoin maximalists are on a fucking rampage against these. Oh, yeah. I'm definitely not a Bitcoin maximalist for sure. I just know that, like, you know, when it comes to the movement of the markets, I just know that Bitcoin has a big say in that. But I'm not on that maximalist side. I definitely think there's way more coins that have probably higher value than bitcoin okay i appreciate you for saying that Not part, part yeah, utility and, usefulness. yes and so i agree now i wouldn't classify myself as a bitcoin maximalist but i'm a bitcoin enthusiast let's just say that yeah same here, yeah, same here. and but here's there's the room thing. to be both i don't know why people uh I don't know why people think you can't, you have to choose between Bitcoin and altcoin. You do not have to choose. You know what I mean? Like, so here's the thing though, with these Bitcoin maximalists, they're starting to sound like gold bugs in cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah. They're starting to sound like the old dudes of cryptocurrency where it's like, yo, nothing wrong with Bitcoin, but it's just sitting there and it doesn't have that much versatility. It's just sitting there. And especially yeah. with the REN, REN, R E N, virtual machine and the REN, I'm like, yo, the Bitcoin I have sitting there, I could just wrap it and then do more with it. You know? Exactly. 
I can mm-hmm. I can wrap it, not lose, you know, not lose the actual Bitcoin, but wrap it and then put it on Ethereum and do shit. And my and my logic, if you're a Bitcoin maximalist, you stay, you know, just you know, I don't know, put on a. a, a I don't know, like, yeah. <laughs> like I don't get it because it's like, bro, it's like. Yeah, I get it. Like, Bitcoin is cool. It's the first cryptocurrency, you know, like the market does. It has the highest market cap. It's been around the longest. But when you look at just Ethereum came out just with smart contracts, you're just like, man. And then even, oh, hey, the show must go on. Yeah, the show must go on. Uh, so Bitcoin maximalists just sitting on a Bitcoin talking shit about people in Ethereum. What's up with that? Yeah, no, that's definitely... If you're following a Bitcoin maximalist and you're and you're trying to get advice from a Bitcoin maximalist, bro, you're gonna miss out on the biggest opportunity of a lifetime. Simple as that. If you don't if you don't take time to learn about crypto and see what else, you know, Bitcoin came out with the first blockchain, but if you don't see what else expanded off of that, you're gonna miss out. Here's the thing with some big Bitcoin maximalists that they don't tell you is that they got in the shitcoin game early. And fucked up 2017 buying all these shits and they all went to fucking crash to zero then they got fucked up and then they said you know what only yep. Bitcoin from now on so they <laughs> see it rehappening and they're not I'm not gonna go down that road like I went down that road before but I'm not gonna tell anybody I went down that road before I'm just gonna say that shit what, what they're trying to say is this this is their main argument and I don't blame them that this is their main argument but this is not a main <laughs> argument to hide behind okay the main argument is you cannot tell me what is the infinite supply of Ethereum. You cannot tell me what the exact supply of Ethereum is. And so, therefore, it's not real money and da 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 da, right? You know, just because Ethereum doesn't have a max cap, that's one of the biggest things Bitcoin maximalists try to hide behind, right? I understand that's a good question, but they try to hide behind that, that that's not real money, it's not worth investing. It's like, yo, there's, an, there's all types of gains in economics that, you know, you know, so they try to hide behind. Yeah, the there's, there's a utility to it. And what and what people don't understand about, you know, there's an argument that could be made that having a fixed supply could actually be detrimental to the long term success of the blockchain. Because what happens when the coins run out and what happens when people only get 0.1 Bitcoin for mining? You know what I mean? And they're not profitable anymore. You know, so those are things that still have to be worked out in the long run well that's why i like ample for so much because there is a problem there's a major problem with inflationary currencies and then there's a problem that people don't talk about with deflationary currencies because they're not using that as a currency they're using it as a store of value so they're not wanting to spend the bitcoin and that Mm -hmm. doesn't help as a form of money so i like where ample forth is coming from you know about them the elasticity being able to this Bitcoin Max just get mad when you call Bitcoin a store of value, but it's like, bro, that's that's the smart. If it's gonna be like gold, that's what it has to be. It has to be a store of value, just like gold. You know what oh, I mean? Like, here's what's gonna happen: is they're just gonna get left behind. It, it may come to a point where e- Ethereum or another cryptocurrency, like you know, Wi-Fi, just surpasses, can do mm-hmm. everything Bitcoin do and more. You know, for sure, and still have a max supply, right? You sure. know, so like, what happens is, is that they're they're gonna. I see them as the old folks of crypto now, and it's like, yo, this shit's yeah. only ten years old. But it's what it is. Is what I want to stay away from is the tribalism. That's the thing. I was gonna say that the, that's the if, biggest problem in cryptocurrency is the tribalism. Even, you will lose even, a ton of money. My bad. Go ahead. No, no, no. Even in Ethereum, there's tribalism. Even within Link, this tribalism, like within every point, like it's just like people. It's like, bro, you can't even like the tribalism is so bad. It's like I could be like, yo, I like energy coin because it's quick and fast, and then people will hit me up and be like, you're an idiot. XRP is faster, you dumbass. And I'm like, bro, like it's not even that serious. You know what I mean, like. There, there might be room for both of them to coexist. There's no, there's no reason for us to go to war over which one's better. And you know, this is new technology. You know what I mean? They're, they, they're gonna find, they, they all gonna find their way, and some of them ain't. So you know. And 
as, as, as strong as the tribalism is, there's one thing that doesn't give a fuck what part of the tribe you are. One, there's one thing that doesn't give a fuck how much you invest. It's called the market. The market doesn't give a fuck what tribe you're a part of. The market yeah, they don't do what the market's going to do. And then people try to be like, look, see? And then when the market doesn't work on their behalf, they're like, shut up. You know, it's like, yo, man. It's some shit's just, like, go ahead. It's like, you haven't seen these prices go up and down. You haven't seen coins have, you know, triumphs and, and failures. Like, it, it happens with every coin. You know what I mean? And, and people want to just holler at, oh. You know, so and so coin got hacked. Okay, well, what are they doing? How are they handling it? How are they fixing it? So and so coin pumped. Okay, like <laughs> you know, it's just so. I mean, and this is for the new people. This is for the new people because it's easy to get caught up in price speculation. It's easy mm -hmm. to get caught up in crypto Twitter drama. It's easy to get caught <laughs> up in uh, tribalism. And so, but at the end of the day, fundamentals. Uh, you, you can't debate those. When things can do, when smart contracts actually work and you cannot do that on Bitcoin, like that is the difference. That's the value proposition. Even though ETH doesn't have a max supply, ETH has smart contracts. And now right. you can build decentralized application. You cannot do that with Bitcoin or not even nearly to the extent you can do it with Ethereum. That is the value. That is the replacement in my mind for not having a deflationary currency. There's going to be pros and cons to everything. And why mm -hmm. not, why, why be just only Ethereum? Why, why not just wrap your Ethereum into, I, I wouldn't say uh, WBTC, but more in, in REN BTC and, you know, yeah. and, and utilize your Bitcoin and Ethereum and make more Bitcoin, you know, and then cash out that REN for more Bitcoin. If you're a Bitcoin maximalist, right. why not use other technologies to get more Bitcoin? In my mind. That's, you know what yeah, yeah, that's what I understand. Like, even if you, and I think it's just because the whole market psychology, that's how it goes, because a lot of people became Bitcoin maximalists in the, in the bear market. You know, they didn't, they weren't Bitcoin maximalists before, but it was like when everything dipped and Bitcoin was the only thing showing some signs of life and every other coin was just continuing to go down and go down, you know, people just started letting the price push them in what direction of what technology they liked and stuff like that. And, and. I want to talk about how price doesn't determine the value of a project. Right. You know what right. I mean? Like the price could be it, even in, um, even in traditional. So you said the price doesn't determine the value of the coin. Yeah. The price doesn't necessarily determine the value of a project because, you know, people like to compare prices, you know, Oh, this project sucks because it's not, you know, it's not as much as link. Well, okay. Uh, maybe Link has a different technology. Maybe they started earlier, you know, but the, even in traditional markets, the price of a stock sometimes is not necessarily based on, you know, what, what the company is actually. All right. One more try. One more try. One more try. One more try. All right. Let's go. All right. So so moving for okay quick question yeah one question for the, right here yeah what what do you, who do you think is the top competitor for ethereum as far as smart contracts are concerned that's a great question i've been doing some research i've been looking into polka dot uh, uh nothing nothing really nothing nothing not even close to be honest Give it coming out like you know two years from now e 2.0 well i mean um hopefully that comes out in the next few months is that what that yeah. Was, um yeah it, i if ethereum does need a competitor and why would i say that it would be safer for the whole ecosystem cryptocurrency as a whole you know if ethereum had a competitor i think i would feel safer knowing that there would be uh, a smart contract platform that can do relatively the same things, hopefully, if not better, uh, just in case things just go wrong or south with uh, Ethereum. Well, well, I mean, Ethereum Classic at the end of the day, even though they got 51% attack the second fucking time again, they're yeah. still capable of doing what Ethereum can do 
as long as more money and more adoption is is put in more miners obviously uh no they can't really do what ethereum can do because if ethereum's movement of proof of stake ethereum classic is going to be stuck with all the limitations of proof of work proof of work so oof, yeah i mean but I if, if uh how do you feel about the idea that if if ethereum's 2.0 doesn't go well, then that's going to bring a lot of developers back to Ethereum Classic. I, I you know, I, in my heart, I would love to see an exodus of Ethereum developers to Ethereum Classic, uh, just because of the, the morality of it. Um, I would just think it, Ethereum Classic would come to a bottleneck and they'd have to move to some form of proof of work, proof of stake. They would have to yeah. abandon proof of work and go to proof of stake and would no longer be Ethereum Classic anymore. Yeah. They would fork again. Yeah. They would literally fork again. <laughs> like, yeah. Ethereum Classic throwback or Ethereum Classic old school. Like, you know. <laughs> Ethereum Classic original. <laughs> yeah, the, the original Ethereum Classic. I mean, I would fuck with the, I, I would fuck with anyone that says code is law. I would fuck, I would invest in any project that says code is law, uh, you know. But um, don't turn Let's, your back. Don't turn. I, I tell people, don't turn your back on Ethereum Classic. Can you can you explain? Can you explain what that means for somebody who might be new? Like, what is what is code is law? What's what's the whole? Why does why do people say that? Like, because that represents the immutability immu of blockchain technology. The fact that once it's up there, once it's in the blockchain, it cannot be changed. And I and that goes the same for smart contracts. So. Yes, I understand that mistakes happen, and ha but at the end of the day, you if you push some code to production that are, other people have you know value and stake on the line, then you need to abide by, in my opinion, true the rules of decentralization. And one of those rules are immutability, and things cannot be changed. And Ethereum Foundation broke that rule. They broke their own rule. Ethereum Classic stuck to that rule, for better or for worse, okay? Yes, if you lost a bunch of money, you and everybody, yes, but you knew about the game before you got in it, you know? Right. And, and that's what keeps, that's the safe, that's the security of it. That's why investors are still looking at Ethereum Classic as a potential good opportunity, because even yeah. though you're not gonna change temporarily, that we feel safer long term. The fact that you chose not to change when you buckled under pressure, Ethereum Classic. Right. So, I, so this that's a form of security, which is a, for, a form of value. And if, if investors right. were like, I, I can, I, I would say, yo, I can count on Ethereum Classic in the long term, right? Even though they may have, you know, whatever in the short term, you know, Ether, Ethereum may have done the right thing in the short term, which is roll back the blockchain, give the investors back their money. That's a short term. But the long term is, can we really trust you? And Ethereum Foundation yeah. says, uh, you know, so that's where the split happened. So I, I say for the new people, don't turn your back on Ethereum Classic because it's, I would, if it were to go as well as Ethereum's going now, I think it'd be a competitor with Bitcoin. I think it would. It has a max supply. It has proof of work. Um, uh, what else? What else? What else? Yeah, it would be able to do what Bitcoin does, but with smart contracts and a max supply. So don't, that's why I'm saying Ethereum Classic could creep up on you and just dominate okay. that game because code is law yeah. just as much as code is law is on Bitcoin. So that's why I'm like, yo, don't turn your back on it. And, uh, you know, and if you could wrap ETC, then that shit would be dope. And they're trying to do integration between Ethereum Classic and Ethereum, like cross chains. So yeah, 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 yeah. Now, what I want to ask you is, here I found a new website and you, uh, it's for everybody. It's called fees dot w two it w t f fees dot what the fuck. Okay, f e e s dot w t f. You got to connect your MetaMask. You're gonna it's gonna hurt, but it tells you exactly how much you spent in fees the entire time you've been using that MetaMask. Fees dot w t f. Right, everybody, go check, bro. And I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, it hurts. Uh, it hurts. It hurts. Uh, I'm gonna tell you the damage I've done so far. But I, I've kind of been in this game a little bit longer. It hurts, man. I came to find out I spent about one full Ethereum in gas fee. 
So three hundred and sixty five dollars in gas fees, bro. Like Yeah, I need I, I, I need to take a look at that. I couldn't believe it, man. I was just like so dis but like once I found out how much other people were spending, I was like, All right, I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. You know. Well, you know, I was looking, I was taking a look at that, and I was like, you know, um, actually, Vitalik has a proposal right now to, to, I mean, not not Vitalik. Somebody had a proposal that Vitalik I seen was endorsing about, you know, changing something, do, changing the fee model, um, because the fees, I think, it's the new bottleneck for, you know, for Ethereum, because I know for sure, you know, I'm hitting, except, and I'm like, oh, come on, man, like, how much, like, I did. You know, if you really try to mess around with DeFi, you like, man, I probably did like three or four transactions, and if each one of them is, you know, five to ten dollars, which what is what it's been, you know, you're like, man, come on, like after a month, you're like, how much did I spend in fees? Like, oh man, that's a whole, like you said, that's a whole ETH. Yeah, and that's the cost of doing business when it comes to being an early adopter. That's the way I see it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Definitely. Being an early adopter, that's the cost. Is that it's like it's like it's like time when it comes to AOL back in 1994. You, you go, it's gonna take you about 15 minutes to connect to the internet. Like damn man, but damn man, but damn man, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like that's the cost of it of being an early adopter of the internet is that time it took, you know, for web pages to load and shit, you know. So, um. Yeah. Let's talk about that because I think it's very important for, you know, people to understand that, like, we are still pretty early to this game. You know, even if you're brand new, listen, like, if this is your first crypto podcast you ever listened to, like, we are still early to this game as far as what's being developed, what's being built, what, what the ideas are, you know, and um, stuff like that, you know. And there's still time to... Take your time. Learn what you need to learn. Don't start rushing in. Don't start fomoing in thinking, you know, it's all about money and you're going to miss the boat. Like, you know, there's, you know, we're still pretty early. So, um, so I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, now, I'm going to just turn the video because we're going to do this audio. Uh, so, what you going to call it? What, what would be mainstream to you, like, how would you know that it is officially mainstream? Like, what would have to be in your everyday experience for you to know, like, it's fully, fully, fully here, the cryptocurrency adoption? Like, what, what, would, what would really click in for you? Yo, Jay, you turn your mic off. Yo. All right. Yo, can you hear me now? Mic off, brother. Uh, so what was that? Did you hear me? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I said, um, I said, um, you said, well, how would I know that crypto is mainstream? Like fully mainstream. Like what? What would it take to convince you that this shit is like actually like in full effect? Like it's here. Um, I think. I mean, for sure, I see it happening. But in order for me to really be like, oh damn, it happened. I say I'll have to go to like, you know, Safeway or Target or Walmart. And, and, you know, when I click payment options, it say crypto, okay. you know, okay. that's when I feel like, okay, we are, we are official. You know what I mean? Even though that's going to happen before people even start taking notice because there's still going to be early adopters to that. You know what I mean? And a lot of that technology, people are competing for, you know, to get that spot as far as like the top one who's developing that technology. But, you know, I think for in the long run, I'll say five to 10 years when I go to the store and they say, do you want to pay in cash? You know, you want to pay in cash, Monero or Litecoin or Bitcoin, you know, like whatever, whatever currency coin that decides to, that it's going to be on top at that time. Um, I think that's when I will feel like, yeah, okay, the prophecy is fulfilled. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one, and I, that's an that's an in, that's an immediate one, which is a good example. It's something that's immediate, like I can go down and immediately see. I can, see it. And, I can actually, yeah. And but for me, what would be mainstream adoption, like in my eyes, 
would be when countries are actually purchasing Bitcoin as their reserve currency. Like when, when Iran actually purchases, like we're gonna spend a couple billion dollars just to have Bitcoin or Ethereum on debt. And then another African country decides to just like, you know what, fuck the US dollar, we're using Bitcoin. And I think that's when the real, real, real money will actually enter is when more and more countries are actually reserving their wealth in the form of Bitcoin or Ethereum. Then we're going to see a shock wave and like of money like we've never seen before, you know? Like that's when the, the tsunami of, of just money starts pouring into to cryptos when these countries decide to, you know, fuck it. Yeah. We're not using the dollar anymore. We're doing all you know, like on on that subject, I feel like, you know, like as of right now, like, you know, I think that, you know, crypto will be up there as far as like being utilized and being like the reserve currencies like that. But with the way that things are going right now, I would say for one, you got you, you better believe that these countries are accumulating Bitcoin. You know, you better believe that there. As soon as the United States said, "Oh, Bitcoin is not a," you know, Bitcoin as a commodity is it's not a scam. Uh, they started, like, in my opinion, I think they started, you know, accumulating. But in the long run, I I don't feel like in the long run these countries are going to bow the knee to Bitcoin because you already see that they're already starting to try to create their own currencies. They're already trying to, you know, give give um, grants to these cryptocurrency companies in order to get their technology and see what's going on here. But I, but don't get me wrong. I think there's room for them to, to coexist. I just think that crypto is going to take, if not all majority of the market cap away from those traditional currencies, um, those, those, those centralized, you know, currencies, but there's going to be always a percentage of the population that's going to rely on a centralized currency and that's going to put their trust in a centralized currency, you know? And, um, and yeah, I agree that's, with you. I agree that's with just, you. I, I deal with in the centralized hug, that's just something that we have to understand. Like there's going to be people who need to go to a bank. You know, there's going to be people who need to, like they're not going to be able to do their own thing. You know, maybe in, you know, when the millennials and the people who are middle school right now are older then yeah, I think, you know, things can, things can start changing, but there's always going to be that percentage of people who need to go to the bank, who love gold, who always say it's gold over Bitcoin, who always say Bitcoin doesn't have any value. Like, there's going to be that crowd of people. Yeah. You know? And, and they're just going to be smaller, just going to be smaller and smaller. But yeah, there's, yeah, people, exactly. there's people that still write checks, you know? So. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, That's my whole Still people that write checks. It, it's good. At the end of the day, it's going to be a matter of convenience. It's just yeah. and, and uh, uh, avoiding taxes. That's really what's. That's probably what's going to drive the crypto. Is this is faster, easier, and cheaper to use, and I don't get taxed. That's what it's, you know. A lot of technology just adopts because of the convenience of it. You know, yeah. and if and if you can't get taxed, I mean, if you're using Monero, if you're using some very Z snarks or. Uh, you know, different types of ways of, you know, hiding. I mean, I just think I, it may happen sooner than we know. That's the craziest thing. Yeah. I mean, look, just a few months ago, nobody was wearing masks on their face. Now people will fucking kill you sometimes if you don't have a fucking mask on your face. So, like, yeah. the world can change very fast. Very mm -hmm. fast, right? So, yeah. it, it may catch everyone off guard how, how, how quick this technology really takes off. Within the next, you know, yeah, you know, who knows, year or two. Um, yeah, if it really, if it really catches on, then I feel like it's going to be like there's going to have to be a uh, um, a time of transition. You know what I mean? And that's what people, I feel like, everybody wants it to happen, but that time of transition is going to be, you know, for me being in the United States, <laughs> the dollar dies. I'm gonna have a hard ass time out here. You know what I mean? It's gonna take it's, it's gonna take some time before people start figuring out. Hey, the dollar is dying, and we need to start switch. Everybody needs to start switching over to Bitcoin before I can go, you know, 
to my store and hand them some, you know, some Bitcoin to get, you know, my, my bread and my, you know, my cereal. Um, you know, it's going to be tough for these new structures to take place, but also it's going to be good in the long run. You know what I mean? Cause we're going to have like, if, if governments have to use Bitcoin, we have more transparency as to where our tax dollars are actually going and stuff like that. I'm glad that you mentioned that because there's a lot of people that want to start their own crypto islands, their own crypto, you know, sovereign nations and, and crypto city. Crypto smart would, city. I mean, if you got army people willing to take crypto as payment, then that's a start. If you know, you got people protecting your island that are willing to get paid in Bitcoin and whatnot. I mean, that'd be a start, but um, I just don't think governments yeah. are going to yeah. uh, die out without a fight. And yeah, I was gonna say, the powers to be are going to put up a, a, a good ass fight, you know, and they're going to try to manipulate and, and do what they can to to keep a hold of that throne. So it, it is, it's going to be a good fight. You know, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, man. Uh, I'm excited because, you know, it means profit, you know. And, oh, okay. Yeah, you know, and it hate to sound like a capitalist, but, you know, this is the hard work we're putting in. And yeah, you don't have to. Talk yeah. about wanting money that's going to keep you safe that's going to provide what you need and at the end of the day you know money is not a it's not a bad thing you know what i mean it's just the way that you know us humans transfer value so you know if you're going to need people to provide you a value then you're going to need that mechanism that we use to transfer value which is you know money and and crypto now and that's why i preach crypto mining being able to mine your own crypto set up your miner uh, I'm able to set up miners for people's uh, Monero miners and mm. you can use Bitcoin as a battery. That's essentially what Bitcoin is being used as, as a battery because, and if you're mining off solar power or renewable energies, you're literally printing yeah. money off free energy. And I have to say yeah. that again when I tell people, you can print yeah. your money off free energy. They like, you're, you're on drugs, that must be illegal. I mean, I'm like, no, you can buy a portable solar power kit that can power a laptop and your laptop can be mining cryptocurrency off the solar energy. All right. Yeah. This is the reality of it. The reality of it. Cause what you're really doing is you're using Bitcoin as a battery, right? Because that sun is shining. That wind is blowing that, that water that's wasted energy. That's not captured. Right. So you right. can capture that energy while you're mining and that, and that Bitcoin acts as a form of a, a battery because the value is held from that sunlight or that wind or that wind blowing or that water running. And then it can actually increase in value as the market goes up. So that's essentially what crypto mining is a proof of work. You're, you're really capturing the value of this energy in the form of a decentralized currency that can grow in yeah. value. And that's, a, that's sure. another artistic, beautiful way to kind of look at it is using Bitcoin as a battery off uh, renewable energies. So it's, okay. and you, you really, really can't be I, I, at I, that point. I never really, I never really thought about it like that. I always, uh, you know, for me, it's like, I haven't really got too much into mining because, you know, mo a lot of the miners are, well, for one, if, you know, I wanted to get like, you know, like an ant miner or something like that, but, you know, I'll be hearing that they're kind of loud and stuff. So here's, here's my thing. And I preach this strongly and people disagree and people agree. If your laptop's already going to be on, or and or your cell phone. I don't know if you saw my minor video. I have five different uh, two cell phones and three laptops mining all at once. Um, if it's yeah. already going to be on, it might as well be making you some money in return. That's that's what that's my logic. If your laptop's yeah. going to be, might as well be getting something back from it. You're spending some. So if, and you're not spending any more awesome. energy mining off your CPU. Now, yes, the profits are very low. Okay, that's understandable. But there's ways you can turn a crumb into a few more crumbs and turn the few more crumbs into a cookie and trade that cookie for three more cookies. I call it the snowball effect. All right. Mm -hmm. You can make a little Monero, you can make crumbs. But after a while, what you really need to know the way you do this is that you find the minimum trade possible on Binance. All right. Binance says you need 0 0.001 to make a trade, right? You mine enough yeah. crypto just to make that first trade. Soon as you can make that first trade, you trade it for Bitcoin, right? So you mine maybe a few weeks, maybe a month on your CPU, enough to make yeah. a trade. 
And while you're trading Monero, you're still mining more Monero. Enough, mm -hmm. right? So what you're doing essentially is, it's called the snowball effect. While I'm flipping Monero to Bitcoin and waiting to flip it back to maximize and get even more, because that's all you're doing yeah. is you're keeping your shit on Binance and flipping back and forth, trying to get more each time around, right? Yeah. Trading, basic day trading, right? So as yeah. you're day trading, you're mining at the same time. So yeah. everything you make from mining, you're slowly accumulating in the Binance account for slowly bigger and bigger trades. I've done this plenty of times with Garlic Coin and Monero. Is that so after a while, you took those little crumbs and you played the markets on an exchange like Binance, and now you have more Bitcoin to buy in more Monero. Now you have more Monero you mine. Now you can sell it for more Bitcoin. And you flip, flop, flip, flop. And after a while, it could really work for you. It takes patience, but it's just a strategy for crypto right. miners. Yeah, CPU miners, because the profits aren't large, but you can make something, right? And the Monero, mark, the Monero is going up to about 890 something dollars, bro. You know, so um, that I look for the most unique ways to make passive income in this game. And there's so many, Yeah. you know? Yeah. And the miner is definitely one to have because once you learn how to mine, no one can take that from you. You know, mm -hmm. no one can take that from you. You put me in a possession of a cell phone or a laptop, I will, I will find a way to profit off of it. So that's why I push so strongly for people because because you can always scale up. If you know how to mine on a CPU, well, you could just scale up. You could just get more GPUs. It's just knowing how the process works and joining the mining pool and getting paid. But you can always scale up. That's the thing. Yeah. You can always. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I hope you out. If you want me to stall a miner, no problem, bro. I got you. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I did. I did some, uh, you know, when I first got in, that was like one of the first things I got into was CPU mining. I was mining, uh, you know, I was mining uh, Electronium, but, um, you know, Electronium is the same algorithm as, as Monero. It's just a fork of Monero. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's just so it's basically the same setup I had. I had mining on my CPU, and you know, I mean, it was you know, it's not like too crazy, but I could definitely see how you know, you leave your laptop just sitting there somewhere, your computer, if it's on all day, and you leave it even if you leave it on standby, you know, over time, those coins add up, you know. And if I think about I've been in crypto now, you know, for all these years, if I kept that miner running this whole time, I'd have a nice little bag today. Well, here's the thing. I, I, I truly believe in the way Bitcoin started. And every person wished they, that they could mine Bitcoin on their laptop. Everyone, right? Cause, but no one at the time knew that that would be that valuable, right? So, you know, that's, that was the game. It's still so not, it's, they, that game isn't over. Being able to mm -hmm. mine cheap currencies, such as garlic coin, I, you can totally mine garlic coin on your CPU. I believe one day garlic coin will be go to a dollar. So you can still do that game, but not, no one's gonna believe in these coins. Like no one believed in Bitcoin. So you right. can still mine these shit coins, but right. no that's, one's really gonna believe them until the market takes off. And then you're like, you know, and then you're like, yeah, I, I truly believed in it. And I mined all these coins. So I love that idea and everybody wishes they can do it. It's still possible. It's still possible. But no one's gonna. So I have, I have a, uh, I have a long term, I have a long term Bitcoin theory. I think that, in the long term, I think Bitcoin has no choice, but to become more decentralized, because, um, you know, right now it, it was like you said, people started off mining on their laptops, and that was the way they did it, and that's the way they secured the blockchain. And then everybody went to these huge mining farms and they're paying, you know, this expensive electricity and all this stuff. And in my opinion, it's, it's not going to be sustainable in the long term. And Bitcoin is going to have no choice but to go back to its original grassroots people mining on their laptops. Because, you know, for me, it's easier for me to make a profit if I'm just mining on my laptop. And it's going to be for, let's just say, a billion, you know, uh, a company that has millions of dollars in overhead employees and you know venture capitalist investors you know in in the long-term run of of bitcoin over you know i would say maybe you know 10 to 15 years you know when the mining rewards are so small that you know if you were to mine a whole block 
it's not going to be worth it for you to to have a, a huge billion dollar mining form a million dollar mining form well ultimately you, that depends on the market value of it but i i totally see where you're coming from um it'll be interesting I mean, go ahead it's a big billion dollars and it probably won't matter but yeah i mean do you really think bitcoin can hit a million dollars huh do you really think bitcoin can hit a million million dollars um you know i i don't know i haven't like me personally i i haven't speculated that high on bitcoin you know like people say it can hit a million dollars but i think they say in order for it to do that it will gonna have it, it would have to overtake the market cap of gold um so yeah I, i'm not sure about bitcoin going to a million dollars myself i think it's totally possible i don't even think that's a high bar to be honest you can go, go higher than that absolutely if countries <laughs> are using bitcoin as their gold as their re reserve i mean countries are going to start outpricing and outbidding each other like you know what i'm saying like you yeah. know and i don't know i i i I, I think ETH can be 10,000 easily, um, you know? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's for sure. I think yeah. ETH at 10,000, I think ETH at 10,000 might be kind of conservative. Just looking at everything that's built on ETH and every, you know, just, yeah. I mean, once, uh, I, once grandma start getting into this technology, I mean, then, then we're finally there, you know? Um, yeah. Once we're finally there, so. But, what it's going to be is like, you know, grandma's going to get in the, into the technology, but like, I think we're so early people forget that like, by the time grandma gets in the technology, she's not even going to know that she's using it. Yeah. That, that's the, yeah. That's kind of the whole point. Exactly. Yeah. Right. They're not even going to, like, right now we pay so much attention to, oh, this protocol and looking underneath and diving deep on the yeah. developer level. Yeah. And, you know, the consumers are not going to give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're just, they're just going to want a good product. You know? True. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to, I'm, I'm part of the education side of it. I feel the only yeah. way we can really bring in mass adoption is each one teach one. So that's why I really host the mentorships is to like get, cause I taught myself everything. I taught myself how to program. I taught myself Bitcoin and everything. So yeah. I understand. Well, that's you're taking advantage of, you're taking advantage of the opportunity that we have here being so early you have the opportunity to build the technology that the people are going to use in the future. And that's where, if you're here this early, I'm thinking that that's what you're here for. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Everybody wants the Jeff Bezos fantasy. Everybody wants that, like, you know, uh, uh, Jack Dorsey kind of like, you know, I built this dap and I just fucking blew up. Like nothing's, I, you know, but I understand that there's a lot of sacrifice and a lot of energy and hours put in just even coming up to mm -hmm. even understand the technology, let alone come up with an idea. Uh, versus, so I'm really interested in the serious projects that are going on in the DeFi space and just as much scams yeah. are coming out. Just as much scams. You have oh Wi-Fi, then Wi-Fi 2, then Wi-Fi 3, then why, why, Wi-Fi 5. <laughs> it's just like, yo, these scams oh, I are think I think a lot of what people don't realize too is like a lot of those coins that are like pumping super crazy like that, like a lot of those are what's called, uh, what are they called? What are those dApps? Um, what are those dApps where every, you got to get in early to make a profit? Ponzi schemes. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, definitely I, I will say they're Ponzi schemes, but they have a, there's a name for them. They call them, uh, damn, I can't think of it right now. Well, you can't really, you can't really avoid that to be honest. It's, there's, yeah. there's certain ones you've got to get in early versus the people who got in early, like Wi-Fi. Anybody who started liquidity mining comp or like, yeah, they got in early and you can't yeah. really avoid that. And those people should always be rewarded because they are the ones who are attracting more people to the space. So it's hard yeah. to avoid people getting in early and making them more of a profit. You know, it's really hard. Yeah, because if, if you have a, what people, what I was uh, explaining to someone the other day is like, you have a proof of stake protocol and you're barely going live with the main net, you want to get it. You want to get as many people on board as possible. So you can secure that blockchain as, as quick as possible. So, you know, you're going to offer super high rewards in the beginning and that's going to trickle down over time as you get more people on board to, you know, more nodes online and more people delegating their, their coins in order to secure that blockchain as far as proof of stake goes. 
Yes, absolutely. And the, here's the crazy thing about this DeFi space, especially with the meme coins, the ten, the tens, the ten Ds, is that <clears throat> people are damn near openly investing in Ponzi schemes. Damn near, right? I'm not seeing enough. Like, cause the tens, like the ten Ds, <laughs> the chicken, the fried chicken tender memes. I don't know if you heard of that currency yet. It's called ten. No, I haven't. Man, you gotta check that out, man. That's like the number one meme, DeFi meme coin right now. It's there's so many memes. It's all about memes. It's just over fried chicken tenders, right? Like chick fried chicken. Uh, but there's it's actually yeah, a legit it's product. Game. Yeah, it's actually a legit project that looks damn near like a fucking Ponzi scheme. And even though yeah. everybody says this is a Ponzi scheme, the shit's still taking off. And why is because the memes are so heavy, man. And so now yeah. in my video, I just watched uh, DeFi meme coins just hit the market. So you got XAMP, which is anti-ample, then you got Tendies, which is like fried chicken tenders, right? And um, <laughs> yeah, it's weird, it's funny, but it's weird. But you know, it's cheap right now. But I mean, the price is going up. So you, what I'm saying is that with these meme coins, don't turn your back on the meme coins, such as Dogecoin, Garlicoin. Now, Tendies, uh, tenders is, there's a market for major, major risk there's a market, and that market is humor, t humor is tied to it. There's yeah, a major sure. risk of investing in Dogecoin. Why? Because it's so fucking cheap that it may never go up, right? They could just keep printing more Doge. But there's a market yeah. for the humor and that risk. That's what meme coins kind of fit in, is that, yeah, this may be a Ponzi scheme, but fuck it, the memes are dope. And that's what's give the market cap has been going up. So yeah. we're seeing a different type of psychology when it comes to trading when it comes to these meme coins is that they break all the rules like like the joker in the castle but check it out like it, it's such a it's such a kind of a scam ponzi scheme but it's actually legit more you know so it's weird it's a yeah. weird it's a weird meme coin that's funny yeah yeah I'll, I'm, yeah. Gonna, I'm gonna check out some of those meme coins like i know dogecoin be doing his thing and it's just dude it's just a don't you know, turn but your back on Dogecoin. Dogecoin will Doge is a Doge dollar. Is and that's been the first one I've been hearing about, you know, like Dogecoin. Dogecoin will go to a dollar. And I'm telling you, here's the thing, though. This is what we, this is what people don't realize. People accidentally got rich in 2017, bro. Accidentally. For sure. For sure. Over Dogecoin. Dogecoin hit a $2 billion market cap. $2 billion. People bought hundreds of thousands of Doge as a joke and fucking got rich accidentally. When have you <laughs> ever heard that before in any other form of investing? Other Never. Than cryptocurrency ne meme coin. Never. You know? Like, so it just goes to show that the power of this technology don't, it'll, it will always surprise you. There's always something coming out where I'm just like, yo, this shit is crazy. Especially with Ave credit delegation. You heard about that with Ave? Um, Ave, no, I haven't. Credit delegation, bro. They just dropped this shit, and that's why I'm hella bullish on Ave. Credit delegation. So you know how you, when you go borrow money from a lending platform, you gotta over collateralize, right? Yeah. Right. We get yeah. it. We understand in the DeFi space, but to anyone who's not in DeFi, they're like, why the fuck would I do that? Why would I need to, yeah. why, would, why would I have to put more money up front when I can just go apply for a credit card and get maybe a hundred, maybe a couple thousand up front, no collateral, right? My credit score right. is good. Like this is how it works. So they're able to get money for nothing, really, right? So, and now you're telling me if I want to get borrow money, I got to put up way more money and get less money back? Fuck that shit. There's yeah. no real no incentive matter. for me to go to decentralized finance when I can just use credit and debt, like, you know? Right. So, <clears throat> so that's the, that was the biggest problem in DeFi. How can we issue money to people with no collateral? Flash loans, yeah, we can do it, but it has to be the same transaction. So how can we yeah. do the same thing and have it stretched out over a month or a year, like a real credit card, right? So mm -hmm. credit delegation introduces that. And that's what's going to be the mass, more mass. So what, the, what it does is when you invest in Aave, you get A tokens, right? You get tokens, like C tokens. Like when you invest in Compound, mm -hmm. you get what you represent, right? Mm -hmm. You get those tokens. What you can do with those A tokens is that you can create a vault 
and delegate your collateral to someone else, to some other address. Mm -hmm. So you can say this address in a smart contract can use my collateral that I put down and they have to pay me back more interest. So it's like yield farming. So not only are you getting, yeah, not only are you getting money from the market, but you're getting money from the interest that you're making. And then you can lend out those tokens that you're making interest for even higher interest by delegating your credit line to somebody else. Uh, okay. And, and, it, and it's done through an open law smart contract. And that open law smart contract is legally binding Ethereum uh, contracts, legally binding Ethereum smart contracts. So you create a smart contract called a vault, some kind of, kind of vault, and you say this address can use this amount of money and this is the amount of interest they have to pay me back and this is the time they have to pay me back. The person putting down the collateral comes up with the whole rules. So yeah, the, yeah, the other person can go and, and use that credit line on their own and pay it mm -hmm. back plus interest. And if they don't, if, if it's potentially legally binding, I got to do more research, but I have the open law contract. Um, so and, you know, uh, go ahead. Something, something, something similar to that being built. Um, it's, it's a very different mechanism. We'll, you know, I'll, I'll say just look it up and then we'll talk about it next week. Um, AKRO is, is developing something similar to that with, um, called yeah. under collateral, under collateralized yeah. loans. Yes, you know. yeah, I did some research on them. Yeah, they're under collateralized, but these, you would still have to put up some collateral. So that was, that was, yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, and that's, it's difficult. It's difficult because the whole thing about cryptocurrency is to not trust anyone. Really, it's, exactly. it's, it's to trust the blockchain. It has to be trustless. So when you, when you introduce something like that, credit delegation, now you, you add in some element of trust. And then if you, that trust is broken, then you would have to use the traditional legal system potentially so how do we yeah. but if you look up aragon which is the decentralized autonomous organization framework that makes frameworks for other DAOs, but they're a DAO uh -huh. themselves they just introduced aragon courts where you can have decentralized courts on the Ar yeah, aragon. Look, yeah, look arrows yeah too. that's what Kairos does a decentralized court system yeah so let's uh, we're going to wrap it up for today but let's talk more about that let's uh next episode okay yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, aloha. Thank you for listening to the Elon Marty podcast with Crypto Roots and Everything Currency. Hey, see y'all later, man. Thank y'all for tuning in. All right. Blessings, you guys. Take care. See, uh, check the links out in the description. Peace. Peace.